We can go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to today's info to go webinar. My name is Annie Gaines and I am the continuing education consultant here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries located in rainy Boise, Idaho. Our webinars and other continuing education opportunities are funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Everyone is muted and we encourage you to use the chat feature to ask questions and discuss with other attendees. As you exit the webinar, you will be prompted to complete an evaluation and we always appreciate your honest feedback. Today's topic is tense tools for challenging situations and uh, tense tools yeah, tools for challenging patrons in tense situations with uh, Steve Albrecht. And just so you know, the slides will be available after this webinar. I'll be emailing those out with the link to the recording. So Steve, thank you so much for being here. I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Annie. Let me uh, make sure our slides pop up here and tell me that they're working okay. Uh, how's that look? We're good? That's great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks for your time and attention. I want to uh, say specifically thank you to Annie Gaines and also the Idaho Commission for Libraries for bringing me in. I see, as I look at the chat, that some of you are coming from other states that I have been to as well, Nashville and some other places, Kansas. I'm in Missouri myself, Springfield, uh, Missouri. Been out here for about four years from California. So I'll tell you my story as to how I got into the library business and specifically library security. So thanks to everybody for coming. I have been to Boise many times. I've been to Meridian. Uh, I did a big program at, at uh, Boise State University and got to go into the blue football field where I got a little queasy uh, walking around out there. And I also have done some stuff um, for Idaho State University, so go Vandals, and uh, have been to your state several times. I did a big project back in the day where I helped move um, buck knives from San Diego to Post Falls, Idaho. So they set up a, a new factory in Post Falls, Idaho, and I helped uh, get all the materials and, and goodies over to there. So uh, for a non-Idaho guy, I've been there a little bit, and I, I like your, your uh, state quite a lot. Uh, the, the weather is always um, um, cool and, and nice, and uh, the scenery is gorgeous. So uh, my approach to our conversation here today is we'll take a quick two hours together. As fast as I talk, it's, it's um, easy to cover a lot of material in a short period of time. So if you say, gee, Steve talks fast, I will say, I told you so. Uh, my materials and slides, and I was discussing this with Annie a little bit, um, I try to do my program in a way that the slides speak for themselves so that if you looked at them two weeks or two months later, you would get a sense of what we had talked about. And it'll be a reminder, sometimes a mnemonic reminder or an acronym or a set of rules or guidelines that could be useful for you. So uh, I encourage you to take the slides um, um, that I have sent over to Annie to your own use, print out the ones that you need, especially for those of you that may be a, a manager in charge, person in charge, manager on duty, supervisor, you can use the slides as, as part of a training orientation. As for a new employer orientation, you can use it kind of an onboarding. You can also use the slides for uh, specific things that you may want to do as a staff. Uh, staff meeting conversations are a really great place to really fine tune some of the challenging patron scenarios and some of the challenging patron dialogues. And I'm a believer in going to the group, the library staffers, whether it's full-time or part-time or interns or volunteers to get uh, the feedback from them as to the people they have to deal with and the situations that they're dealing with. And so I have uh, been working in this field for uh, 22 years now. I'll tell you about my background here. And also that give you a sense that there's no perfect answers, but oftentimes the answers we're looking for come from you. I'm trying to give you the guideposts and some, some things to maybe help you set better boundaries and also help de-escalation and some, some scenarios uh, based on that. We'll go through a concept called the, the uh, top 10 most challenging patrons. Uh, some of them may be very familiar to you. We'll talk about some specific things to Idaho that, that Annie has discussed with me, uh, some things around concealed carry, uh, people coming into the library, which is the same issue we have here in Missouri and also uh, protesters, people that are, are uh, upset with the types of content that we provide in the library, whether it's, it's programs or materials, we'll talk about those folks. Um, I also have a, a, a concern where I have seen uh, these people coming in now that videotape and take photographs of people 
in the library. I have concerns about that from a safety and security perspective, which we'll talk about. So you can see all the cool initials after my name. I have a, a, um, a doctoral degree in business administration. I have a master's in security management. I have a BS in psychology. Some of you think psychology is BS. I get that. I have a BA in English. I've written 24 books. I'm working on book 25 right now, which is a sequel to the book you see on the screen here, the library security book that I did for the ALA back in 2015. I'm writing a new uh, book called The Safe Library. I have a certification um, from the Society for Human Resource Management in HR. Um, I have a security certification called Certified Protection Professional, or as we call it in our world, Certified Paid Paranoids, right? I'm a paid paranoid. And also uh, uh, have a certification from the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals called Certified Threat Manager. I have worked in workplace violence prevention since I wrote one of the first books in the United States on workplace violence in 1994. I uh, got the book on Oprah, which is pretty cool. My partner did anyway. And uh, I've been working in violence prevention since that span of time. I've interviewed three uh, workplace violence murders in prison as part of my research, and I continue to work in that field as well. I have a great relationship with Steve Hargadon at Library 2.0. Uh, you can see the website there is library20.com. It's a free uh, membership. There are about 65,000 library people who are in uh, Library 2.0. I encourage you to join. Uh, we do free um, uh, podcasts. I do two or three, uh, one or two of those a month. I do one or two blogs a month, which are on library safety, security, service, management, leadership, um, staff um, issues. I do two of those a month. And also I do um, uh, paid webinars. We do two of those a month as well on various topics. So library20.com, sign up for free, take a look at all the cool stuff that we have there. And also my website, uh, drstevealbrecht.com. Got a lot of library stuff, got a lot of safety and security stuff. Um, got some, some things which could be useful, some videos and things that you might like to see as well. So uh, Alfred Hitchcock said the length of a film should be directly related to the endurance of the human bladder, or, or in my case, uh, an hour, and then we'll take a break for about 10, 12, 15 minutes. We'll come back and we'll finish up. So we'll take a break at the top of the hour. We'll come back after 15 minutes and we'll get you, get you wrapped up. So my training programs tend to be hour, hour and a half, two hours. I've done four hour programs. I've done six hour programs by Zoom. Um, I like the Zoom format. I think the platform's pretty stable and it, it's great for me. Um, so... Here is uh, my background. I started teaching library work workshops in security back in 2000, and, and I was living in San Diego at the time. I'm going to go off the uh, video screen now that you've seen my face. I was working in, in San Diego at the time, and I was the workplace violence guy, and I had written the first book uh, in 94, which uh, really sort of foreshadowed workplace violence as an issue until Columbine and things like that really made it a national concern. I got a call from a, a group called Info People, and some of you may know Info People in California as a grant-funded library program. And the Info People folks said, Steve, can you, you're a workplace violence guy, can you talk to us about library safety and security? And I said, well, this is 2000, mind you. I said, what could possibly be going on at the library where you'd need a guy like me? And they said, well, how about if we send you around to some libraries and you, you can see for yourself? I said, okay, so they sent me to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Sacramento, um, uh, Berkeley, Oakland, San Jose, uh, even San Diego, my own hometown, where I got to see what was going on at the grassroots ground staff level with libraries in terms of confrontations and safety issues and security concerns that the staff had. So I put together a program for them in 2000 and started taking it around California. I taught that program dozens of times around California. And then I started teaching it around the country. And then in 2010, ALA said, can you do some webinars for us? And I said, sure. And I started doing ALA webinars. In 2013 or 14, they came and said, can you do a book for us on library security? And I said, sure, I can write a book about anything. And they said, this is sort of a sequel to a book that some of you may know that some of you may be familiar with called The Black Belt Librarian. So that was Warren Graham's book. And I think he's retired now, but I, I sort of wrote a book that was uh, uh, you know, an attempt to sort of be the next generation of, of thinking on library security. So that book still exists. I'm doing the next book for uh, Roman and Littlefield called The Safe Library, which uh, I'm turning the manuscript in in a couple months. It probably should be out in the fall, as I believe. So I've taught this program around the country live uh, in 25 states and also online since the pandemic to hundreds of libraries and thousands of library employees. I appreciate their feedback and their, their concerns. I try to 
address things that are custom to what's going on in your library. And that's why I appreciate from Annie the, the feedback about certain things that are Idaho specific or Idaho library specific. Uh, those of you from other states can certainly take uh, the same thing from me. And again, I ask you to think about what you can get from the slides as a future reference. Um, can you use it as a staff meeting discussion, as a kickoff, as a training thing, or as your own personal uh, development as a library employee? Again, Library 2.0, two podcasts, a couple of blogs a month, a couple of uh, webinars a month that we do there, and take a look and see if those uh, are useful for you. So a couple of things on our agenda today. One is, whoops, I'm going backwards here. Um, we're going to talk about the code of conduct, and, and I'm a big fan of enforcing the code of conduct in a way that is firm and fair and consistent and legal and appropriate. Um, I believe the code of conduct is should be our marching plan for a lot of things that we're dealing with in the library. I also like a posted code of conduct, and I'll talk about the value of being able to see it from outer space, that it's not just on a clipboard or on the website or on a piece of paper that we hide under the circulation desk, but it's actually in a place that patrons can see, and I like poster size. Um, um, code of conduct as a way to get people to say, I'm not picking on you. This is not about you. This is about an important concept in our library discussion here, which is the impact on the business. And I want you to think about all those issues that you have in terms of patron behavior and whether it is a low business impact issue or a high business impact issue and sort of in the middle as well. So look at a patron sleeping in the corner. For me, that's a low business impact issue. It does not affect the business of the library. Patrons screaming, threatening people, you know, panhandling, uh, touching folks, uh, making a mess, that type of thing. Higher business impact issues, obviously. And one of the concerns that we have in the library world, and I share the same issue with you, is that sometimes we are introverts trapped in an extrovert's profession. Some of you are introverts like me. I'm an introvert. I write books. That's what I like to do. Um, but I work in an extrovert's gig, which is Dig Steve for two hours while I talk about this stuff. And I have to be a situational extrovert, as some of you do as well. Being a situational extrovert means that you have to ramp up your assertiveness when your first thought is, I want to go in the back and, and do something else, not have to deal with this angry patron, this person that's obnoxious or rude or whatever it happens to be. You've got to change your sort of uh, acting style to reflect the fact that you've got to be more assertive in a, in a positive way when you're dealing with certain patrons. So I, I feel your pain, those of you that are fellow uh, introverts, uh, we are trying to sometimes um, do the best we can in a high human contact, high transactional type of job where you see a lot of people all day. Now, my wife, who's a lights and siren extrovert, loves people, feeds off people, gets energy from them. Me, I need to come home from the party and take a nap. So we'll talk about uh, communication skills, service skills, security skills. I'll give you some tools for each of those, especially around de-escalation. I've got some books for you to think about, three or four that I can think of off the top of my head. I like talking to library people about books because they pay attention to them and they actually look at them, which a lot of people I talk to about books just nod politely and walk away. Uh, we'll talk about boundary setting, especially around um, a, a couple of shadow issues that I see. One is harassing behavior from patrons of a sexual or racial nature. Um, that, that really bothers me that's, that is not addressed uh, accurately and correctly in some libraries by the leadership. I'll talk about the top 10. I got 12 up there, but it's top 10 patron behavioral issues and, of course, lots of other cool stuff. So people ask me all the time, I will be teaching this program in you know, Ypsilanti, Michigan, or upstate New York, or Texas, or Florida, or California, or Idaho, and someone will say, what's the best thing or to say or to do when dealing with uh, challenging patrons? And I'm a good consultant. I always say the same thing. Well, it depends, right? It depends on how you feel, whether you feel afraid, whether you feel angry, whether you feel an anxious about the encounter, whether it's a normal encounter for you, or it's an abnormal encounter, whether it's a, a, an issue that affects the safety of other people in the library, it's a serious threatening issue, a potential violence issue, or it's just something that kind of bugs other people and irritates folks, we have to address it. It's always hard to know what the perfect answer is. Many times in my training career, I will be coming back from the bathroom or getting a cup of coffee on the break and someone will come over and say, can I tell you about this scenario we had with this guy that came in the library? And oftentimes it'll center around things like he stares at people. And we discover that perhaps the person has some form of autism, and that's the reason that he does it. Uh, we have um, certain patrons that are that are too um, much interested in, in staff's personal information and do about a sort of prying and digging. And so we talk about potential solutions for that. So I'm a pretty smart guy, um, but I'm not perfect in terms of my answers for everything. I have some great guidelines and tools for you. Take what you need from our conversation, from the chat. 
uh, from anything that you see with each other that you engage um, that we'll, we'll talk about in the chat questions if we have any. I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, you can certainly also email me and say, Steve, what about this particular scenario? Um, I do a, a column for Library 2.0 called Ask Dr. Steve, where we talk about specific challenging patron issues, but really be as flexible, think on your feet, be assertive, be intuitive, follow the code of conduct, and you'll be on the right track. So a couple of things. One, I have a sense that, that patrons and people in general tend to follow behavioral patterns, and they do the same things over and over again that keep themselves in their comfort zone, even if they're negative. So it's, a, it's negative attention behavior. It's negative um, towards uh, making other people uncomfortable around them. They still keep doing it for some reason. Uh, some people have a positive outlook and a positive impact on other folks, and that's what keeps them in their comfort zone. But there are people we deal with who have a negative outlook, a negative sort of perspective. They like being irritating for some reason. They get something out of it, and it's an odd behavioral pattern. I oftentimes think about how people are such creatures of routine that they will do things over and over again, even if it's not working for them in a positive way. And so in my world, I do threat assessment and threat management, school violence prevention, workplace violence, domestic violence in the workplace. Um, I look at a good predictor of useful predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Every time I've dealt with this patient patron, he's been a jerk. What's the chances he's going to be an angel today? Well, possibly I'll hope for angel, right? Every time I dealt with this with this patron, she's been wonderful. What's the chances she's going to be a jerk? Eh, probably not very likely, but I'll be ready for that if it happens, right? So this, this sense that you have of reading the situation and the person and going, what has been their usual pattern oftentimes can be useful, especially if we have our own patterns and our own concepts and our own discussions about how we provide the best answers to the best scenarios that we have come up with, where we say, this is what we usually say in this situation. I'll give an example. We'll talk about the um, person who wants to come in and videotape or photograph people as part of some political issue, or they want to have some sort of confrontation with you about COVID or, or you know, transgender uh, books or whatever it happens to be. Their, their pattern is to want to get you to say something provocative and to be on, on TV or posted on their social media account, which sometimes has, you know, three followers and sometimes has 30,000, depending. So that we say, okay, here's what we usually say in this situation. Here's our usual pattern, our usual pattern as library people. Here's what we typically say. We have vetted this conversation. We've vetted these answers. We've talked about them as a staff and as leadership. So we're saying the, the same thing. And we're basically, you know, to use the metaphor of singing on the same sheet of music every time we encounter this particular situation. So it works both ways. They, the patrons have their patterns. We have ours as well. I spent my entire adult life um, taking care of people, being a shepherd, trying to, it's not a religious thing, but it's a care thing, trying to take care of people in safety and security. My background, I worked for the city of San Diego for 15 years in the same, same sort of safety role. Um, uh, for me, disruptive behavior from anybody without consequences gets worse. That doesn't mean we have to run a prison camp or something, go around, you know, beating people over the head with the policy manual. In fact, one of my conversations with you is not to say the P word to patrons. And that P, the P word is policy. Sir, that's just our policy. Sir, I don't write the policies. Here's ma'am, I'm not the one that's in charge of the policies or you have to speak to my boss. I try not to say the P word to patrons. I try to say something like our usual approach or one of our guidelines or how we typically handle this or usually the rules we try to follow here consist of, right? And when you think about beating people over the head with the law book or the policy manual, it usually makes things worse. So I always think about boundaries and I always think about how we can put the brakes on escalation behavior from patrons by enforcing consequences. That means kicking people out of the library on a daily basis or on a, for a week or a month or a year. That means enforcing consequences with teenagers or kids. That means enforcing content consequences with people who wanna bypass our rules. So even negative attention is attention. And think about the people that you deal with that want negative attention. And one of the concepts we talk about in psychology, and here's where I get to use my degree, is a concept called extinction. Extinction says, if we extinguish attention towards negative behavior, oftentimes it dissipates because it's not getting the desired result. When we kick the, the, the ball back into their side of the field, they kick it back and forth with us. That, that is the opposite of extinction, which is engagement. So one version of extinction is when someone does something that's, you know, they say something provocative, you just don't answer. You don't say, sir, you can't speak that way in the library, or that's not how we do things, or that's not allowed. You just look at them and they try it again. And then you look at them and nothing happens. They don't get their desired result. And then you get back to what you want to tell them, which is let's focus on this, or let me help you with this, or let's walk towards the exit door while we talk about this. And you extinguish the behavior by not addressing it. 
those of you with kids know exactly what I'm talking about. When my daughter was a little girl, she's 28 now, thank God. But when she was a little girl, she would go to the cereal aisle or the candy aisle at the store and scream and yell for a bag of, you know, sugar frosted chocolate bombs. And I would say no. And she would cry and throw herself on the ground and, and you know, threaten to call child protective services on me. And I would say, come on, let's go. And I would not address the behavior by saying, okay, I'll give you this one thing if you just stop crying, because then what it proves to them is that stuff works. So extinction with kids says, I'm not going to address the, that issue. I'm not going to debate or argue or negotiate with them. I'm just going to extinguish it by moving on. Works with patrons as well. So one of the big themes that I have in our conversation is that we focus on the business impact issue. What impacts the business in a negative way? Little things can, can be a small business impact issue. Big things can be a business impact issue and vice versa. Some stuff that bothers you doesn't bother your colleague down the road. Some stuff that bothers you that doesn't bother you at your library could be a significant issue. Uh, things in libraries are geographic. They are, they are economic. They are cultural. There are things that you say, this stuff happens all the time. Not that big of a deal. You know, we have loud kids because we're near a junior high school. Other people say, oh my God, this is, you know, it's out of control here. It all kind of depends, doesn't it? Think about this. Um, I, I went through a training program with a guy that's a friend of Oprah's named uh, Gavin DeBecker. And DeBecker wrote a really good book, which we're going to talk about called The Gift of Fear. Uh, in The Gift of Fear, DeBecker says, intuition is a powerful drive for what we want. And he also says, we need to set boundaries with people that start at one end of a spectrum and go to another. And the one end of the spectrum is observe and monitor. Just watch and see what's going on. The second end of the spectrum is take steps, take actions, right? Well, sometimes in the library world, we get too much on the take steps, take action step, and we skip over the observe and monitor, and we don't move from a start slow, start slow and friendly kind of perspective into a tougher perspective. Well, keep this in mind. You can always get tougher. You can always enforce the, the code of conduct. You can always uh, You can always ask people to leave or get security if that's a function you have or get the police. You can always do that. But sometimes just squeezing all the toothpaste out of the tube at the beginning of the discussion, beginning of the encounter, especially when it's angry, is not useful for you because it's hard to go back to being friendly if you've been tough at the start. We can always get tougher. So think about observe and monitor at one end of a spectrum and then take active measures at the other. We have lots of steps. And here's the cool part, lots of discretion along the way. And here's what I say all the time in library. I don't care what you look like, I care what you do. I'm not into profiling people. I'm not into judging people. I'm into looking at what their behavior is. If their behavior hurts the business of the library, we address it. If it doesn't, we move on to something else to do. So De Becker wrote the book called The Gift of Fear. Some of you may know it. Many women in my life and around that I have met in my world uh, like the book a lot. It came out in the 90s. It's come out in a couple other editions. Uh, De Becker's got a master class now that he's doing on The Gift of Fear, which I think is on LinkedIn. Um, he's Oprah's security guy. He's Jeff Bezos' security guy. I think I've heard of Jeff Bezos. I think he owns some kind of bookstore or something. Anyway, um, De Becker's book, The Gift of Fear, talks about intuition. It's knowing without knowing why. We ignore it at our peril. We have examples in our life when we should have listened to the little voice, and it creates what are called pilo erections, which is the hair on the back of your neck or on your arms stands up. And the biggest intuitive neuro organs in your body, your heart, literally, the nerves in your heart, your head, and your stomach gut feelings, things like that, tell you what to do oftentimes in intuitive situations. So when you say to yourself, should I get my boss for this encounter with this person and that's what you think you should do, do that. If you say, should I get another colleague to help me, do that. And we'll talk about hand signals and code words as we go forward today. Should I disengage and just go into the back room and shut the door and call the cops? If your intuition tells you to do that, do that. Should I walk this person to the exit? Should I shake hands with this person? Should I go sit down with this patron? Those are all tools for the toolkit we're going to talk about. It's based on your intuition, tells you what to do. So for library leaders, take what you need from my conversation with you for the slides to help you with coaching, to help you with training, to help you with new employee orientation, uh, model the ideas that you like, help staff with conversations about the tools that they want to use and give them approval for that. For library employees, take what you need from, from from me and the chat and the scenarios and adapt what you need to your specific workplace, geographically, um, um, culturally, whatever happens to be in your particular library where you work in a one person library that's two hours from the cops, you work in a downtown library that's across the street from a homeless shelter, you have completely different needs, take what you need from me and the materials. So I'm big on the essential eight here. This is a code of conduct that's firm, fair, legal, consistent, assertive, patient, empathic, and reasonable. Are we focusing on this person's behaviors? What are they doing versus labels? He's a jerk is a label. 
she's a this is a label, right? We focus on behaviors. I don't care what people look like. I care what they do. And I judge them not on their appearance. I judge them on their behavior as a behavior, not a label. And I use behavior-based language, not label-based language. The last one, can we accept other people without accepting their negative behavior? So let's go back to the, this idea of the code of conduct, which is not only um, um, important, but for my world, if you look at the right-hand photograph here, visible. This is a code of conduct from a library in Northern California. Look at the four things that they've chosen to emphasize this week or this month. And this poster changes all the time. They put different things in here and it's on wheels. They wrote, roll this thing around the library. I love this idea. I like the idea of a code of conduct being visible and large. So we are firm with everybody. We are fair with everybody. We are legal, meaning the code of conduct has been vetted, talked about attorneys, library leaders, library boards, friends of the library, things like that. We are consistent. We are assertive with everybody, even if we feel a little bit in, in uh, introvert mode. We're patient with everybody. We're empathic, saying things like, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry that happened. Tell me more about the situation. Let me take some notes. We'll talk about empathy. And we're reasonable. And that is a court-tested phrase in, in, all, uh, in all court jurisdictions to say, was this organization reasonable in its treatment of this person? Was this response reasonable and based on the level of concern for danger? Were, were we reasonable in our application of this policy? It's a very critical phrase and reasonable is an important part of this essential eight. So if you look at these eight concepts here and they're abstract in some ways and also concrete in others and depending on how we apply them, the most important one for me, of course, is consistent, which says Monday through Sunday, Monday through Saturday, whenever your library is open, we function the same way. We are firm, fair, consistent, legal, patient, empathic, assertive, reasonable with everybody seven days a week, six days a week. We do not have the kind of library where Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we run a pretty tight ship, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we do whatever we want. That's not what we do. We are, we are using this in a consistent basis so that street people, people that are homeless or people that have mental health issues who talk to one another about what's going on in the library, people that have substance abuse concerns and people who have behavioral problems and come to the library and want to act up and say, no, you know, if you go there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they, they run things pretty, pretty tight, but Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you can do whatever you want and make a mess and run around. That's not what we want. Consistency of application, consistency of message, consistency of approach all the time. Treat people firmly, fairly, legally, consistently, assertively, patiently, empathically, and reasonably. Now, inside that eight here is a critical skill that you have, or you should have, or should develop, or should be improving that other people, especially patrons, especially angry patrons, especially anxious or fearful or distracted patient, patrons do not have, which is listening skills. One of the biggest issues I have seen, especially as we come out of the, po the pandemic with the, with the fighting and the arguing and the ar fighting on airplanes and all the things about the masks and the, and the, and the behavior around uh, you know, health department policies and federal government policies is that people are not good listeners, especially under stress. You need to be a better listener under stress because they are not, which means, and this is the tough part for us, you may have to say things over and over again to people before they get it. And when you're talking about something you want this person to do, you may have to explain it to them more than once because they just don't hear you. They're distracted by their kids or their, their peers or people around them or their cell phone or their own life issues, the things they're carrying around, you may have to say things more than once. So it's not being a broken record. It's sometimes you just have to get through the haze, the fog of their poor listening skills. Be a better listener on your behalf um, because that is a powerful tool for us. It's, it's a tool for empathy. It's a tool for patience. And it's a tool to help you figure out what your next steps are. But lots of people we deal with, and you know this in the library, don't listen very well. Okay, uh, second book, we talked about De Becker's book. Uh, I like Crucial Conversations, written by uh, Carrie Patterson and Joe Grenny and Ron McMillan and Al Switzler. The book was a huge bestseller. It, it, it really defined two types of conversations. One, what they said were 80% of our personal and professional conversations were routine, normal, casual. They called those just normal conversations and we're, we do great, we do fine. The conversations we have at home and at work and in our lives, routine, normal, casual, easy, we do well. The, the conversations which become crucial from their definition, the stakes are high for one or both parties, emotions run strong for one or both parties, and there are lots of options as to what to do to solve the, poten the, the, the uh, uh, potential issue, that's a crucial conversation. And what these authors have said is when we step into these crucial conversations and think about this in your personal life, have you ever said something that's ruined your relationship with your spouse or partner for the next 48 hours? 
thank God I never have in 32 years with my wife. If you look at our professional conversations where things deteriorate, where people lose their temper, where people stomp off, where people um, get angry, where people um, shut down, uh, give people a silent treatment, those are, from their definition, crucial conversations. We need to have a better set of tools, and that's what the book talks about, for when those 20% conversations happen. Stakes, stakes are high, emotions run strong, options, opinions vary as to what to do. A lot of good videos on YouTube about the Crucial Conversations um, um, toolbox, the perspective. Uh, Ron McMillan does a really nice one. He's, he's kind of a gray-haired guy. He's got a dark dark suit on and a green dress shirt. That one's about 14 and a half minutes. That's typically the one I use in, in longer training programs where we look at the Crucial Conversations perspective. So I like that book a lot for customer contact, patron contact employees, and really works well for managers and supervisors as a coaching book as well. So I talked about some of these issues that we face in the library. What is the business impact? Do we rationalize unacceptable behavior? And sometimes that's part of the assertiveness issue that we have or the, the, um, the introversion issue sometimes that we have. Do we say stuff like, well, I'm not a cop or a social worker or a lawyer or a psychologist. What am I supposed to do? And the answer is help each other and your supervisors help you enforce the code of conduct in a safe way. What's our goal in the library? Is it peace or justice? The answer is peace. We'd like another boring day at the library. Nothing horrible happened. No, no staff issues, no patron issues, no, no ambulances, no cops, just another peaceful day at the library. Fourth one, what should asking for help mean? And in some work cultures, in some library work cultures, asking for help is a sin. And the sin is, well, why don't you know how to do this? Or you've been here a long time, or how come I have to come over and help you? The answer for, should, can you come help me is, sure. Let me, let me drop what I'm doing and come over. Let me just help you do something important here called change the ratios of confrontation. Changing the ratios of confrontation says you don't have to jump in. You just sit, come over and watch your partner, your colleague, your coworker, watch his or her back while they engage with somebody. And I'm going to give you some hand signals for two of those. One situation, and I'll demonstrate them a little bit later, is where you point at the person and then point back to the ground next to you, which means come here and help me right by my side. The second one is, is point at the person and put your palm up, which says, come and sort of stand in the periphery on the edge of this conversation, see watch what's going on here. Many times, changing the ratios of confrontation with a patron where you bring over somebody else is not ganging up on the patron. What it says is, I have a witness, so you can't make any kind of claims that I said or did, did things to you, patron, that are, that are you know, you would say later to my boss, like I called you a racial name or said or did something inappropriate. The second is, it sort of goes back to the idea of someone's watching my back while I'm doing my thing, and it says to the patron, there are more than one set of eyes from the library staff on this particular issue here. How do we align with patrons? And this is a critical fact here. Sometimes we just do better with certain people. There are patrons that come in a library that you get along with great, others not so well. And it may be based on age or race or gender or previous contact or previous experience where you're just not their cup of tea. They come in and they go, I don't want to talk to you, but I'll talk to your coworker over here or vice versa. And you go, here she comes. She seems to hate your guts. I'll, I'll talk to her. I, I get along with her. Okay, I'll handle it. We can trade off. We can kind of swap out each other and say, you're the best person for this. Maybe you're a Spanish speaker. Or maybe you have previous experience with this person. Maybe you're younger and you're talking to this, this teenager who's, who doesn't seem to like you know my, my gray hair, whatever it happens to be, where we are aligned better with patrons and it just the end result is a better solution. Doesn't mean you, you can avoid people that to talk to. Just say sometimes if I'm a better fit, it's up to me. If my colleague or coworker is a better fit, it's up to my colleague or coworker to take over. The other part of alignment is sometimes your boss will come over and say the exact same thing you just said word for word. The patron says, I want to speak to your supervisor, comes over and says the same thing you just said. And then they comply and you're like, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I just said all the same things. Isn't it funny how they had to hear it from me? That's okay. Your boss should say, I bet that you said the same thing I just said to this person. Isn't it funny how they had to hear it from a boss, quote unquote. Do your job or do your job safely. You know what the answer is. Do your job safely. Steve, uh, these two kids uh, from the high school with 17-inch biceps were punching each other in the library, and I ran over there to break up the fight. I'm like, what? You did, you did what? No way, right? Look at those situations where sometimes you need to go over and take charge, and look at those situations where you need to simply be a professional witness. I would say, stop fighting. Leave the library. Stop fighting. Leave the library. You got to leave the library. Stop fighting. I try to get these guys not to fight, but I'm not going to go over and put hands on anybody. And when I think about these situations here, sometimes you go, I have to do my job. Well, there's nothing in your job description that says you put yourself at risk. Think about how you do your job safely. And one step for you to make is to be a professional witness, which says, I will watch from a distance and decide what to do. 
Maybe I call my boss. Maybe I get a coworker. Maybe I get security. If we have that function, maybe we call the police. Maybe I clear out as many people as I can around that situation while, while, and until it solves itself, de-escalates, or the cops get here. We talked about the value of empathy and patience in the essential eight, right? Firm, fair, consistent, reasonable, legal, em empathic, patient. Now, how do we show this? We show it in our body language. We show it in our tone, especially over the phone. When you go, what is it, sir? Right? That little hook, that little energy we put on the end of things. Okay, ma'am. You know, that condescending hook, that drives people crazy. I'm really, really, Im it's a really, really important that you focus on being as empathic and patient as you can. And here's the deal. At the end of your work shift, just as you started at the beginning of your work shift, at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's easy to feel empathic and patient. At six o'clock in the evening, it is not. Right? You really got to think about your tone, your body language, your eye contact. You roll your eyes, people see that. You look at your watch, people see that. You, you say things you know, face to face or over the phone where you have this condescending hook. It drives people crazy because it makes them feel like they're talking, you know, they're being talked to like a child. Be careful. We talked about consequences. We talked about the value of, of intuition for disengaging. We talked about assertiveness. You may need some acting skills. I also am a big believer in space and distance, especially in the pandemic. We learned a lot about social distance, but sometimes for people who are having mental health issues, substance abuse issues, fear, anger, anxiety, coming too close to them raises the emotional temperature. I use space. And sometimes when I feel fearful myself, I use proximic barriers like desks or counters or tables or chairs or shelves or half shelves or carts that I put between me and really angry person. And I do that as a, as a protection device for myself, but also to say, I, you know, I need some space where I feel more comfortable. This is a social issue with human beings. We have social space, we have personal space, we have intimate space. People get assaulted a lot in intimate space, namely healthcare providers. Social space is what we've been dealing with during the pandemic. And that sometimes is different for you than the person that you work with. For you, social space may be you're too close. For other people, culturally, especially, like, you know, closeness is part of my culture, it doesn't bother me. Think about how you use space. And the last one, I think is an important issue as well, is the value of praise. Hey, thanks for your patience. Thanks for waiting over there, sir. Um, thank, thanks for, for staying over there for just a second while I look this up. Ma'am, I appreciate you bringing in your paperwork so we can get to the bottom of this. Thanks a lot for that. I think praise does a lot towards getting patrons to feel like you're listening to them. And also it rewards them in a positive way for doing the right thing. And so, you know, I've said to scary homeless guys, Hey, you know, thanks for not shouting. Uh, thanks for bringing it down. Th thanks for, for stopping, stopping the yelling. Cause you know, you're, you're kind of scaring people here and they're like, Oh, sorry, sorry. And it works, right? Praise goes a long way towards getting people to self comply. And, and praise is the thing that oftentimes many people are looking for anyway in their lives, right? From somebody, right? So a couple of service tools. I'm going to talk to you about a, a concept called GREAT, which is a, a, um, an acronym for service. But look down at the bottom there. These are the important ones. Another day for you on the job, another service interaction for you on the job, but significant service interaction for the patron or an important day for the patron. Let me, let me give you an example, which you all know. Um, one of my best friends, his um, sister has worked a series of jobs where, you know, it's, she always got referred into it or met somebody who helped her get the job. She's never had a resume. She hasn't had a resume in 20 years. So over the weekend, she came to the house. We worked on her resume. I put it together. I sent it to her yesterday. She's going to start applying for these jobs. She doesn't know how to apply for jobs using an electronic resume where she has to upload it. So I'll help her with that. Um, you know, I helped her get an email address, all the things that you would say, well, you know, I do this every day. What's the big deal for that person, that resume or that email address or that ability that you help them to upload their stuff onto a job site, Indeed or Monster or whatever it is, the job, job search places is critical. It's important for them way beyond the importance for you. You go just another day for me. So look at those interactions that you have with people and say, is this significant for this person? I got to ramp up my game. Is this important for this person? I need to be on my best professional uh, game here in terms of problem solving for them. Because you can say, well, what's the big deal? For that person, getting a job is a huge deal. So at the top, one of the things we think about in sometimes in libraries, we can accidentally embarrass people. Uh, somebody comes in to pay a fine. Somebody comes in to pay for some program and their credit card doesn't go through. And so you go, sir, your, your form of payment bounce didn't go through right in front of God and everybody. They will remember that forever. You'll say, well, it was true. I, I mean, I had to say it. Okay, then do what I do, which is use physical movements. Sir, can we step over here? Can you, can you come over here for a second? And I use something called the assertive whisper. Can, can we talk over here? Here's what happened, okay? Your card didn't go through. 
can you come up with another form of payment or you come back tomorrow with cash or whatever, right? When you use physical movement and you step the person away from a group, which could be his or her peers or spouse or partner or kids or whoever, and you have that assertive whisper conversation, which says, I'm not going to broadcast this in front of everybody. You help patrons save face. Okay. Third point, we talked about the second one, body language, tone, condescension. Third point, moments of truth. This comes from a book my dad wrote. My dad's name is Carl with a K, Albrecht. Um, CarlAlbrecht.com has got all my dad's books, 40 of them or so. Uh, my dad wrote a book in 85 called Service America, which, which was a huge bestseller. It sold a million copies about customer service. And what he said was, every time somebody comes in contact with our business, over the phone, face-to-face, -face, over the internet, in the parking lot, walking into the building, over uh, uh, the telephone is a moment of truth. It is that time where they make a value judgment to us about the service they receive from us. There are trillions of moments of truth going on all the time in the world, face-to-face, -face, over the phone, over the internet. When you log on to the library website as a patron and you get what you need, reserves, holds, books, downloads, whatever it happens to be, and it goes successfully, positive moment of truth. When it crashes, when they don't find your account, when you can't get the thing to work, negative moments of truth. Think about how much control you have over a lot of those moments of truth that start and end with you in terms of how we serve people. And that, that uh, fourth point there, service blueprints. This is critical. Think about those situations where we have an opportunity to fix a bureaucratic snag or some sort of choke point that happens to patrons and staff all the time. Somebody comes in to pay for some program or something, and they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, it's a lessons or, or literacy program or something where we, we, we have to charge them a fee, right? And, and they paid $10 over extra accidentally on their account. It was you know, $82 and we, they paid you know, $92. We have to get them 10 bucks back. And that takes an act of Congress and 16 you know, letters from the president and everything to get this person 10 bucks back and three months. A service blueprint says, let's look at the system or the refund, and let's look at the stakeholders who has to be involved, finance department, you know, finance clerk, administrative person, department director who has to sign off, whatever it is. Get, get those stakeholders on paper, get that, those steps on paper and start to look at the snags, start to look at the choke points, start to look at the bureaucracy, start to look and say where this is handed off from this department to this department and get screwed up. Service blueprints can help staff feel better about things that are common mistakes. And also it, it keeps us from re-victimizing patrons for things that make them furious. Okay, the great service tool. Greet, reassure, explain, act, and thank. I know you know this. I'm just giving you kind of permission to think about this acronym as, a, as a, something to put in your back pocket. Eye contact with patrons, important, right? It's, it shows not only respect, and it also is a safety thing from my perspective. I'm a, I'm a security guy. Um, we talk about, about uh, I did robbery prevention for shell stations around, around California for many years. And I talk about eye contact when we see anybody walking into a, a convenience store, right? Same thing with a library, whether you're at the circ desk or some other place or in a room or working or walking by, you just make careful eye contact with everybody. Just to say, I'm here, I'm here to help you, but I also see you as a human being. I also see you as someone I'm not ignoring. It's important. Reassure the patron you're here to help them. That's probably, that, that one and the explain part are probably the most critical part of this acronym, which is, hey, thanks for coming in. I'm sorry yesterday didn't go so well with your, your son or daughter on the, on the thing that we tried to set up or in the computer and didn't work or whatever it happens to be. When you explain and reassure, what you're saying is I'm here to help you, but the explanation part is really, really most important of this acronym is most important. What it says is, sir, can I ask you to just wait over here for about five minutes while I go in the back and pull this information? Ma'am, I need to talk to my supervisor. It's going to take me about 10 minutes. If you could sit over here, I'll come right back to you. Thanks for your, patron, your patience. When we explain things to people, it checks boxes for them that you're being an advocate for them. Give me, here's an example. This may happen to you. It happens to me a lot. Maybe I got that kind of face. I don't know. I go to the restaurant with my wife or some of my friends, and she says, how many? And I go, a table for four. And the hostess says, okay. And she grabs four menus, and she turns and looks around the restaurant, and then she walks off. And I always have that same conversation with myself and everybody else is, are we supposed to follow her or do we stay here until she waves us over? And then she turns around and sees that we're not standing next to her and waves frantically and we come over and sit down. All she needs to say is, let me go find a great table for you. I'll be right back or come this way with me and I'll take you to a table. But she doesn't. The explanation part is what checks boxes for people. Think when you go to a restaurant and they give you one of those little gizmos, that's a little pager, it buzzes or it turns, you know, red, red lights or whatever tells you your table's ready. It's great, right? 
You don't have to listen for your name. You don't have to stand outside in the cold. You don't have to, you know, uh, sit at some loud, uh, loud, uh, loud or noisy bar and try to listen for, is that my, you know, do they call Steve or Dave or, you know, the thing beeps, you come over the, to the hostess stand, you go get your table. That's an explanation as to what to do. And what you're going to do on behalf of the patron makes a big difference. Act accordingly and then thank them. Now, here's the part about thanking, which we know sometimes happens in library world. You do an hour's worth of work for a patron. You help them with the resume or the uploading or the this or that or the genealogy, and they don't thank you. They just wander off. That happens, right? Sometimes you say, thanks for coming in. Hope I was able to help you. Good luck with the project. And they go, all right, and they walk off. Take your own care. Take your own self-serving nature to yourself. Say, I know I did a good job. Helped them on their behalf. Did my job effectively. Move on. Sometimes they won't say thank you. That's okay. We, we say it anyway as part of our work. Greet, reassure, explain, act, and thank. Okay, got a couple other little acronyms for you, some other reminders, especially from the service perspective, which is uh, introduce, explain, and ask. And this is one of my favorite tools because introduce, explain, and ask is a low key way to get compliance. Hi, I'm Steve from the library. The reason I came over was, I'm sure you know about our guidelines. Uh, remember not to say the P word unless you have to. Uh, we have a code of conduct on that. I'm sure you already know about it. I just wanted to ask you, could you do more of this or less of that? I'm going to give you a concept called thought stopping. And in thought stopping, sometimes we ask questions of people to sort of get them to stop in their tracks. <clears throat> you know, I'll give you an example of thought stopping. Somebody's cursing and you come over and you go, wow, I haven't heard those kind of curse words since I was in junior high school. And the person's like, huh? And then you got them back down on the wavelength and you can have a conversation about not cursing in the library. And one of the things I might do in the explain part, the explanation or explain part is, I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask you to do, right? And the person goes, yeah, yeah, turn off my cell phone or whatever happens to be, right? Sometimes you can kind of get that buy-in early on by just saying, hey, you know, I'm coming over not to lecture you, but just to say to you, can you do what I'm asking you to do after I've explained to you why it's necessary? I have a couple of phrases and you'll see these on the, on the list I have coming up here. But my two favorite phrases in library world are, you can't do that if you want to stay here. And the second one is our insurance won't let you do that. The second one's great for kids, is it not? Kids trying to skateboard down the stairs or you know jump his bicycle off the top floor or something. Our insurance won't let you do that. It's a great phrase because it's hard to prove and it's probably true. I work with a lot of insurance companies who probably wouldn't like some of the stuff they see in libraries. The second, or the first one I talked about is you can't do that if you want to stay here is also a great phrase because it says, here's the stuff you can do, here's the stuff you can't do, you decide. Guy's trying to come inside with a shopping cart full of all kinds of trash and stuff. You say, you can't bring that in if you want to come inside. Happy to help you, but you can't bring that inside. Then you have to say, he says to himself, I have to make a choice. So I try to get people into a situation where they decide what they want to do. They go, um, all right, I'll just leave. Then you go, okay, I'll see you next time, right? And it's not you telling them what to do, not bashing them over the head with the law book or giving them the, the P word policy. It's you can't do that if you want to stay here. You decide patron what you want to do and if it sounds okay to you then go okay great or they say all right i'll do this and you go okay thanks for your cooperation thanks for your help thanks for following our rules so we have the great model we have introduced explain and ask okay here's our first little quiz type of uh, scenario here we'll get ready to take a break here in a little bit open carry um look at the game of thrones weapon that you would see here on the guy on the left here that brought us into the library in pasadena that's his elbow on the ground as he's being wrestled to the ground by library security folks in pasadena california um he must have got that knife uh pokey stabby thing from game of thrones because you can't get that at walmart right um is this guy dangerous to people yes is this a police call probably so i mean if this falls on the ground and the guy puts it back in his pocket and look pocket and looks embarrassed we have one issue if the guy's holding it when he walks into the library we have another issue correct and we will talk about how we define and divide what our response is i'm going to give you a set of of guidelines it's kind of like a decision tree okay let's go to the guy on the right how he got a hole in his behind where the gun goes i don't know i hope it wasn't something he ate or he shot shot through his pants but anyway I have seen people who do open carry in, in um, libraries to be provocative, to be challenging. They come in with an AR-15 across their, across their you know, chest, uh, or they have some kind of you know, complicated strapping and banding system where they're carrying stuff around. Oftentimes, it's to see what the library's response is. Now, you have to go back to a couple of things, and we'll talk about this in the decision tree. What's our, our, our policy on this? What's the state law on this? What's the county law on this? What does our code of conduct say in connection with those things? Where... In some, uh, some states, you're not allowed to bring firearms into libraries, mental health hospitals, jails, courthouses, you know, other things like that, city hall, county, county administration buildings. 
Other places, not, not addressed. What does your policy say? Now, if you have somebody that has a firearm like this and they reach up for a book and you see that it peeks out from under their jacket and they quickly cover themselves and go, oh, sorry, that's different than a person who comes in with this thing on his hip or her hip and walks around proudly with open carry. Oftentimes it's done to be provocative. Oftentimes it's done to stimulate a contact from you. And you say, wow, that's an interesting gun. What kind is that? And then maybe they tell you. And so you can have responses that range from, oh my God, there's a guy with a gun in the library. Somebody call the police. And it turns out to be a big um, chaotic mess when that wasn't really the right call. Or you can say, there's a guy with a gun in the library, call the police, everybody get, out, get down or get out of the way or, or, or run because that was the necessary thing to do. Again, it's back to discretion. And it's back to what I talk about all the time in these scenarios, which is the content of the situation and the context of the situation. Um, based on having worked in law enforcement for 15 years, um, I have a universal um, uh, concealed carry permit for all 50 states. I renew it every year. Um, I was a domestic violence detective. I handled 1,500 cases in that time span in San Diego. I, I, I go to the range in, in um, Missouri here, and I renew my card, and I send it to my agency in San Diego, and they send me a new ID card every year. I've been doing that since I retired. When I look at that situation, I don't want to draw attention to any firearms that I am carrying off in, as a retired cop. Uh, they're always covered. They're always holstered. They're always safe. No one ever knows. Um, and in that situation, it's a contextual thing where I'm not trying to be provocative and frighten people. In this situation, you have to say to yourself, what's this person's intent when they do this and have a conversation, a careful conversation to not, you know, in, uh, um, enrage this person, but also to get to the bottom of what's going on with their intent. Okay, one more book for you. We're talking about um, books for your bookshelf. We're coming up on our break here. Um, Verbal Judo by George Thompson. Thompson's book is a huge bestseller. Uh, I always give it to people uh, as a suggestion for customer contact, taxpayer contact jobs. Uh, Thompson was uh, a professor of rhetoric in the University of Tampa and Verbal Judo and the Verbal Judo Institute, which he founded before he, he passed, um, is, is famous around the world. And he talks a lot. I've been through his programs. I know his, his instructor staff. Um, he talks a lot about an acronym I use a lot called LEAPS. Uh, active listening, which we talked about was not a, a prevalent thing amongst uh, um, patrons. You've got to be better at it. Empathic listening. I see, I understand. You could be right. Tell me more. I'm sorry that happened. I apologize for stuff that's not my fault. And so should you. Sometimes it just checks a box for the patron. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Doesn't mean you were there. Doesn't mean you were responsible for the bad experience. It just checks a box for them. Ask questions. And here's the deal. Ask open-ended, extractive questions. Who, where, when, why? When did you come in? Who did you talk to? Not well, did you fill out the form? Did you get a library card? After you got your library card, then what happened in that situation? Ask more open-ended questions. When you paraphrase for somebody, it says, I'm paying attention. If I understand you correctly, you're upset about how your son was treated when he came in yesterday with his friends. Is that correct? Right. And then the last one, seek solutions. And here's one of my best solutions. Okay. That sounds good, sir. I'm going to write the mayor and give him what for. Okay, sir. Here's the mayor's address, right? You don't have to have a dog in the fight sometimes. I think sometimes we look at de-escalation as everybody's got to be satisfied or win. Sometimes for de-escalation for me, I'm like, okay, that's cool. Go do your thing. The last one for Seek Solutions is sometimes I do walk and talks with people. And walk and talks are when I find that the best reaction with human beings is when we're walking side by side collaboratively and neutrally rather than face to face. Think about all the confrontations in life, face to face over the counter, you know, uh, toe to toe, nose to nose. That's how gunfighters gunfight and boxers box. He got in my face, she got in my space. Think of all the language we use around face-to-face -face confrontations. I simply say, let's walk and talk. Let me walk you to the exit, sir. Ma'am, I'm heading over to this other department. I'll, I'll walk over there and show you where you need to go. And sometimes you can hand somebody off to another colleague or just get them in the right direction by simply walking and talking with them. Same thing for me is in terms of shaking hands. Before the pandemic, I shake hands with angry people. Now I, I read intuition and I decide whether it's the right thing to do, but sometimes shaking hands says, hi, I'm Steve, what was your name? Oh, okay, Larry, hi, thanks for coming in. What's, what's going on here? Can tell the person I'm a professional person, I'm not afraid of you, and I wanna act like a professional person and I want to model what professional people do, which is we shake hands. How about going to sit down with somebody? You don't have to sit knee to knee, it's not a counseling session, but maybe we sit down. Good social distance, right? And we say, let's talk over here. And you can leave your desk and go sit down with a person for a couple of minutes if you have that ability. What it says is, let's act like human beings. I learned this from my bar bouncer friends, right? People don't get in fights sitting down, they get in fights standing up. So I always say, let's go sit down. And that changes the 
direction. It uses physical movement. It puts me in charge of the situation by asking this person to comply. If they don't, you've got a different situation on your hands. If they do, we start to see that, okay, they can be reasonable in the situation where they feel angry or, or frustrated or anxious about what's happening in the library. The last thing is Thompson's discussion of verbal judo or VJ, validate, don't justify. So we talk about validating phrases. Our insurance won't let you do that. Can't do that if you want to stay here. Look at all these phrases that you see on the screen here that you probably use in some combination that you've stolen from a colleague or a coworker or a boss, or that you used in another job, which seem to work well. Think of those phrases that are connected to compliance and de-escalation and, and getting this person to calm down without telling them to calm down. Thompson says in verbal judo, when you say to somebody, you need to calm down, sir, what you're saying to them is you don't have the right to be angry. And that's why people get furious. Think of the phrases that you have used in your career that have worked in that, in that validation versus justification phrase. Okay. Now, the other approach is the phrases that don't work. You need to be quiet. That's not our policy. I'm going on my break. Good luck with that. You wouldn't understand. Look at the last one. Why can't you be reasonable, sir? Which is just a real conversation argument starter, right? Think about those phrases you need to remove from your vocabulary, things that you may say when you're frustrated or you're tired that make things worse. Don't say these things and, and jack this person up because it, it just pushes their buttons. And we think about uh, Calvin and Hobbes in, in the idea of, of um, you know, is there a best, best way to say calm down to somebody is, is not saying calm down. A couple of security tools here as we come up on our break. Space and distance, we talked about this no closer than arm's length. I use proximic barriers. I use angle um, discussions where I will stand not toe to toe, nose to nose, chest to chest, face to face with somebody. I simply move my feet 45 degrees off. I'll demonstrate that um, when we get to, to another part uh, in the, our discussion in the second half. Um, changing the ratios of confrontation, bring over a colleague or coworker who maybe has better alignment than you do. Maybe it's a boss or a coworker who just connects better with this person, or maybe it's you. Acting skills speaking assertively, fake it till you make it, fake it till help arrives, shaking hands or sitting down or walking and talking with the person as you go, the patron to another part of the library or out of the library. Um, that fourth one there, security incident reports are big value to me. They tell me as a security guy what we need to focus on. They can also tell your bosses. They can tell elected officials. They can tell people that, that, that spend or allocate the budget dollars what we need to improve in terms of security, whether it's training or devices. And as a learning tool for us as a staff and staff meetings, it also educates people about problematic people between other branches and also educates staff that when this person comes in to your branch, here's our universal way of handling this particular situation. And you can also think about the value, whether it's from the security incident reports or just um, anecdotal information over a span of time, how we handle certain uh, scenarios in the library involving problematic patrons, challenging patrons, uh, uncomfortable patrons is the staff meeting role play. And I use these a lot in my live programs, which is I bring folks together and say, okay, in groups of six or seven or five or six, take these and I usually give them a dozen scenarios, work through each of these scenarios where you have one person be the library staffer and one person be the library um, 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 patron and, and work through the challenging scenario and come up with some language and words that you would use and, and do this like the real thing. And then uh, other colleagues, coworkers, give them feedback on what you have seen, what you liked, what you might do differently and come up with a universal way to solve these typical issues that we face on a regular or daily basis. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction here. Okay, let me try this again. <clears throat> I love fake library stats. This person on Twitter makes me laugh all the time. 48% of librarians celebrate Friday night by locking themselves in their bedroom so as to recover from another week of human interaction. And if you're, a, you're an, uh, uh, an introvert, you know exactly what I mean, makes me laugh. So Calvin has said this and Calvin and Hobbes in the history of calming down, has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down? And the answer is no. Okay. Stop saying calm down to people are not calm. Last thing to talk about before we take a break. Okay. These are my 10 critical core questions. And you think about these on an intuitive basis for those challenging scenarios you're dealing with in the library. What's my intuition tell me to do? What's common sense suggest that I do or not do? Sometimes I just observe and monitor or I don't have to do anything. What's the impact on the business in our library? Is it low, medium, or high? If it's high business impact, I've got to do something about it. What does our code of conduct allow or prohibit when it comes to this issue? What is our policies and my training, what I've been trained as a staff member to say or that I need to do or say? What's our usual approach to this situation based on the work culture we've created here? Rural library, different than downtown library. 
library next to a homeless shelter different than a library you know 20 miles outside of town library that's by a college or university or high school or elementary school or junior high could be different in terms of how it handles uh, disruptive students and do we follow the essential aid guidelines firm fair consistent reasonable empathic patient legal fair for everybody that's the guidelines right do we see any violations of local state or federal laws it's you know a guy smoking pot in the inside the you know the bathroom or somebody bringing an exposed firearm when we don't allow that in the library is it a medical issue or we might need paramedics this person is having a medical concern like a drug overdose or a heart attack is it a mental health issue where this person feels fearful or anxious or afraid or threatening is it something if we have security that they can handle themselves or is it a police issue or do we need some other kind of agency like social workers, adult protective services, child protective services, um, homeless outreach, we'll talk about some of those. Is there a creative outside the box solution for the thing that I'm dealing with that I, we have dealt with before that we call this particular person or we have a person on staff who has particular expertise. Uh, someone comes over who who is is uh, is deaf, and you have a staff member who is trained in American Sign Language. That is the outside the box solution, where you call that person over and say, "Can you can you translate for what this this patron needs?" So I don't have to have you have this as a checklist in your back pocket. A lot of these things are intuitive, but think about your range of possibilities. This is a decision tree here. These ten critical core questions is a decision tree as to what to do in certain situations in the library. Intuition. Is it you know legal issues, code of conduct, policies and training? What's the best approach based on how we've typically done things in this scenario? Okay. So when we get back from break, um, why is my there we go? We get back from break. We'll look at the challenging ten: harassing patron, entitled, rude patron experiencing homelessness, patron experiencing mental health issues, patrons experiencing substance abuse issues, teenager, student patron, patron who takes videos or photographs. Uh, that could be a Facebook posting thing or a uh, creepy guy kind of a thing. We'll talk about that. Patron who po protests content, uh, elderly or disabled patron. And there, my focus is on the potential for abuse, like for children, adult protective services versus child protective services, and then the patron who hogs or misuses the internet. So that's what I've got uh, so far. And I will look at the chat questions on our break. Uh, if you have any you want to put in, that's great. Um, see you back in 15 minutes, and we will continue our conversation. Thanks, everybody. You know, it helps better if you have the microphone on to be able to talk. Thanks, everybody, for coming back. I want to start you with this challenging 10 list here as we wrap up our second half of the program. When I look at this use of the word challenging, this is an intentional discussion I had with a, a longtime librarian many years ago, 20 years ago, who said, when I first started this program, it was called the difficult patron. And the program that I did for info people in California was handling difficult patrons. And there was a stigma to that. And, and I, it was sort of a blind spot for me. And someone in the library world, you know, one of the directors said, can we change the, the, the vernacular? Can we change our, our semantic description of patrons as being challenging? And because not all of them are dangerous, not all of them are, are frightening, not all of them, some are just frustrated. Some of them are, are frustrated with our systems and how things are going on in their life when they come into the library, their, their exposure to trauma and things like that. And she was exactly right. So I switched over my thinking to say these people, these types of patrons, which are archetypes, 
and I don't like to label people, but their archetypes from the standpoint of discussion for us to figure out our best approach are challenging. As simple as that. So one of the issues that I faced in my work as a human resources professional is, is sexual and racial harassment, where employees sometimes are fearful about reporting. They're fearful about telling a, a customer or a taxpayer or a patron no in terms of giving this person personal information. They don't want to be, quote, rude. And when in reality, they're, what they're doing is setting appropriate boundaries and setting consequences for this person, especially we want to set consequences as a as a uh, organization that says this stuff is not allowed. There is no harassment allowed for library employees of any part-time, full-time, been there a long time, been there a short time, any age, any race, any gender, doesn't matter where you say I'm entitled to work in a safe environment. Now, part of that is management's responsibility and vigilance and policy and intervention. And second is that we need to tell our bosses when these things are happening. Let me uh, give you the next slide as kind of an example of what I'm, I'm talking about. According to the American Library Association, and I've just checked these stats recently, the ratio of women to men in libraries is about 70-30. So I've been in libraries where the employee said is 50-50. I've never been in a library where there have been more male staff than female, but for the most part, it is a female-dominated staff from the leadership on down to the, to the front line. As a result, there's much more harassment going on, and I think of this as a shadow issue where employees are afraid to talk about it because they're embarrassed or they're afraid that their response by their organization is not what it's supposed to be, in which, which means consequences and enforcing boundaries. So when we look at the introverts versus extroverts piece, sometimes being ex introverted says, well, maybe it's my fault, or we say these rationalization things to, to ourselves, like, you know, maybe I said the wrong thing to this person, when in reality, it's the harasser's fault, and that's where the, the focus should be. Um, the concept of multiple channels of reporting is really critical in library harassment prevention, which is how do we um, tell multiple people in the library, person in charge, manager on duty, my director, my boss, or someone outside the library chain like human resources or the city attorney or county council for your particular your um, city or, or county. We look at the purpose of setting boundaries with patrons that says you cannot engage in this kind of behavior with our staff. We're going to kick you out. And when you look at the management's response to this thing, it needs to be firm and fair and 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 within policy, but it also needs to be swift and we need to enforce real consequences. And my thing to library staffers is when people ask you personal questions, go, I don't answer personal questions. I'm happy to have your library business. Are oh, you married? Are you dating anybody? I don't answer personal questions. And you don't have to say it in a rude way, but just see matter of fact, in which case you say, you know what? I need to go do another part of my job. So I have two sort of phrases that I remind staff to use, which is I need to go help someone else, or if no one else is around, I need to go do another part of my job and then walk off. You, you can't be faulted for setting personal boundaries for yourself. Lastly, stalking. All 50 states, including where we started the first law in, in uh, California when I was um, um, coming on in this uh, workplace violence business, we started the first uh, stalking law in California in the 1994, I think, 92. Uh, or maybe 95, right around there. And it's a felony in all 50 states. Stalking is a behavior where a patron, whether it's a stranger or to someone that you may have had an intimate relationship or a dating relationship with, is putting you in a position of fear. You're afraid for your safety, uh, that you could be harmed at work or at home. That is stalking and it is a, a situation needs to be discussed with your boss and, and uh, with the police. Okay, entitled rude patron, I pay your salary. You know this guy, right? It's a woman or a guy who has this sort of dismissiveness and, and they ignore our rules and they're sarcastic. They can be a little bit bullying or demeaning. Uh, they, this is a, uh, the reasons are this works for them in their life and they do it at the bank and at the restaurant and they, they mask their low self-esteem with this sort of over-the-top bravado. I think one of the most important things about the entitled to rude patron is not taking it personally. Um, I'm reminded of a colleague who says, get a Q-tip from the medicine cabinet and, and carry it around in your pocket and grab onto it and hold it. And when this person is shouting at you about your horrible services or whatever that you're doing that they don't like and say, Q-tip, quit taking it personally, meaning to yourself, I'm not gonna let this guy ruin my night. I'm not gonna let this woman carry, carry home inside my head and ruin my evening because he or she was not appropriate in their behavior. You can um, be firm and fair and consistent, maybe some impatience and acknowledging their impatience. Hey, sorry, you had to wait. I'm getting to you right away as soon as I can. We're a little short staffed here. Thanks for your patience. Praise them when they act appropriately. Use alignment, which is maybe I'm the best person to deal with this person or not. But ignore their comments. Things that they say, you know, my, you know, I'm not getting good service here, and I want to write my my the you know my mayor. Okay, just ignore that stuff. You can't change their minds most of the time. This is a pattern for a lot of these people. 
Now, you can be courteous to them. Don't expect sometimes courtesy back, but if you can get on their same wavelength in terms of praise and support, sometimes they will surprise you by being more compliant later on. Um, those of you that know me at all in this work know that I'm a fan of Ryan Dowd. Ryan's Dowd uh, Ryan Dowd's uh, book, The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness, was published in 18 by the ALA. I always say to Ryan, I wish I had read uh, his book before I wrote mine in 15, because there are a lot of stuff I should have put in my book about, about uh, his knowledge of, of homelessness, having been a homeless uh, director in uh, outside Chicago in a place called Hesed House. Uh, Ryan's book is great. I recommend it, uh, homelesslibrary.com, a lot of cool videos and things that you can get. Some of you know Ryan's work a lot. Um, he talks about fire tools, which are punishment driven. I'm going to kick you out of the library, as opposed to water tools, which are empathy driven. Hey, could, could you ask your buddy to quiet down so I don't have to ask him to leave? Can you help us keep it quiet when you're talking to you know a couple of guys that come in and make it problems? When you look at, at homelessness from his perspective, he talks a lot, Ryan Dowd does, about the people who he has seen in his 30 year career of working around this population, which is 50% have no major life issues. They're homeless for a very short span of time, two weeks or less, they get off the streets with help and support. Um, some people who have two weeks to a year of being homeless, and that's sort of the cut line, have one major life issue, which usually substance abuse or mental health issues, not both, but one. And they're about 40% of the homeless population. Now the, the problematic population that we tend to deal with, and unfortunately the police tend to come across is that chronically homeless, which has multiple life issues, which, which has been typically substance abuse and mental health uh, problems as well. Whereas the encounter with them is based on a couple things. One is they um, have a real difficult time following the rules because they have had that challenge their entire adult lives many times, and they have ruined a lot of relationships that they have, um, a family, friends, children, uh, employer, uh, uh, healthcare providers, uh, landlords. Th those relationships have been, have been ruined by their behavior. And as a result, this would be the ones that we have most problematic issues with typically in libraries and also unfortunately sometimes with the police. This group needs our patience. This group needs our vigilance. This group needs for us to pay attention to their safety and our safety as well. Sometimes what their issue is is a mental health concern. Sometimes it's a police concern and you have to be able to make a good judgment as to which one is which. So in my perfect library world, I talk often about um, the, the value of the team approach to mental health issues, substance abuse issues, or homelessness. Sometimes people have all three, which is a team approach where we bring in various stakeholders that have expertise in these areas. Um, city and county homeless shelters, county behavioral health, uh, mental health services, uh, uh, um, addiction uh, services, voc rehab, job skills. Now look at the bottom there, faith-based and grant-funded groups, St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic Charities, Lutheran Charities, um, um, Goodwill, places that, that have a connection to the community that are helping people in jobs and housing and things like that, which we may be able to bring in in a, in a team kind of based approach. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, police and sheriff's departments have things that are called PERT teams, so the psychiatric emergency response team, which we had in San Diego. We have a hot team in San Diego where I was a homeless outreach team. Um, we look at adult protective services or child protective services. We have elderly people that are homeless that are needing help. Uh, we may have a housing authority in our community that can help us as well. Where I have seen the best success in the library world is where the library leadership can bring these people together as a committee, as a workforce, as a, as a, as a task force and say, what do we do? And how do you help educate our library staff so we can give the services that we may be very useful to people experiencing mental health or homeless or, or substance abuse issues, access to showers and places to store their stuff and all the things that, that, that go with that population. The problem I see typically in my experience is these groups meet in February and then not again until November. What happens is we lose momentum, people change jobs or leave or quit or retire, and, and the library folks, in especially the leadership position, need to be the ones that keep this process and these discussions moving, at least in my perfect world, on a quarterly basis, where we get folks together and say, okay, we've got new team members, new uh, subject experts, what can we get from these particular people, and how can we continue to provide services to our staff to be able to talk to the people that come in, we come in contact with. Um, so in Library 2.0, I've done a webinar with Gina Simmons. Dr. Simmons is a uh, psychotherapist in San Diego, and, and she has a lot of experience in working with people that have a trauma background, not only PTSD, but anger issues and some other concerns. So we have done a, a series of webinars about people that have mental health issues coming into the library that have a trauma background. 
You can look at some articles that have been done by ALA, by some social workers, some people who have been librarians and social workers about folks coming into the library that have, have a trauma background, which influences their behavior. One of the things that I got from Ryan Dowd and his work and his book, and he and I talk frequently, is that how many people in the homeless, chronically homeless uh, community, the 10% uh, community there, have undiagnosed autism. And they may be on the, uh, the, the spectrum for autism, which re reinforces their poor social skills and the fact that they keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, if you have come across patrons with mental health issues, they're oftentimes fearful and anxious. Um, they, the most difficult ones to deal with are those that are out of touch with reality and, and delusional. They're not typically dangerous to other people. They're oftentimes more dangerous to themselves, but they can be dangerous to others, uh, unfortunately. Look at the bottom there, careful tone, space and distance. Don't loom over them. If they're sitting down, squat down next to them. And then there's something called the three type criteria. The three type criteria says, if this person, and this is all 50 states, if this person is a danger to themselves or a danger to others or gravely disabled, I need to call mental health professionals, typically the police or paramedics to have them taken to a mental health facility for an evaluation. Sometimes that's a mental health hospital. Sometimes that's a, a ER. And when we look at the three type criteria, danger to self, that is a person who is, is going to harm themselves. It's danger to others who's going to harm other people or is threatening to harm other people. The most difficult of the three type criteria, and we don't need all three, we just need one of the three to call the police or social services or paramedics, is gravely disabled. Someone wanders into traffic and almost gets hit by a car and has no, no realization of that is gravely disabled. The problem is gravely disabled is a really difficult term to define. And so police have a difficulty with it. Social workers sometimes have a difficulty with it. Psychologists and psychiatrists can't even agree what it is. When I'm around this population, I am empathic and patient. I try to set appropriate boundaries for them. We, suggest, we look at sometimes two step forwards and three steps back with them. And in the last worst case scenario, we may need restraining orders against that, those, those people that are so problematic to the library that they create fear inside the library every time they show up. The problem with this, this population is oftentimes they under-medicate or self-medicate, or they're not connected to uh, appropriate psychiatric medications uh, where they go on and off of them, and they use uh, drugs and alcohol to, to medicate, and that makes their behavior even worse. Uh, the, the most difficult issue I see with this in the police perspective is the cops don't have a lot of um, training and talking to these people, especially in de-escalation skills, and they tend to go hands-on, which, which is a bad optic and can be dangerous for, for everybody, including the person being arrested. So let's talk about substance abuse, which is sort of the third part of the tripod of, of difficult um, uh, patron behavior. Cindy Grove is a, a colleague of mine. She is a librarian in Maine, and she wrote a uh, book for ALA a couple of years ago, I think last year, maybe the year before, called Libraries in the Substance Abuse Crisis. A worthwhile book. I, I read it. I reviewed it. I did a, a Library 2.0 webinar uh, on her book uh, as a book review kind of course on substance abuse in the library. I like her stuff a lot. I think she's very empathic and has a plan to help library people understand what's going on in their community. Um, if you look at substance abuse in terms of the United States, the biggest issue we see now certainly, of course, is fentanyl and fentanyl and opiate drug use. Uh, which makes people susceptible to overdose. So I'm going to tell you a medical thing here based on my age versus perhaps your age. I'm 59. If paramedics came into the library and found me on the ground, the unconscious, the first thing they would do is break out the heart attack paddles based on my love of, of steak and, and uh, ice cream, right? If paramedics came into the library and found you who was 25 years old or 30 years old laying on the ground unconscious, the first thing they would do is give you Narcan. Narcan is an opiate antagonist. It is a nasal spray. You may have seen it and used in videos and things um, where it, it stops the um, respiratory failure of someone who's taken too much opiate, either fentanyl or heroin or pills. And so the rule of thumb these days in our world, because of the vast number of overdoses that have happened based on fentanyl and, and heroin and opiates, is to give people that have, have collapsed or in respiratory failure of a certain age, it's, it's, not, it's probably not going to be opiates for a guy my age. It might definitely be opiates for somebody who's much younger because that's, that's who tends to use these things. So when we deal with people who have a substance abuse issue, the first question you ask yourself intuitively is, is this a behavioral problem of theirs or is it a medical problem? If this person is slumped in their chair and they're sitting in kind of a funky way and they're not, not uh, rousable and you, and you worry about that, call paramedics. This person could be in, in medical distress. We've seen organizations and libraries uh, lose people to overdoses. Denver had one, San Francisco's had many, uh, Los Angeles has had them, New York has had them. Uh, we see libraries now volunteering staff to, to get Narcan training. 
You can go online and figure out how to use Narcan at narcan.com. Uh, it's a nasal spray. It's quite easy to use. I have used it on people I thought were dead and they pop back to life. It is a miracle drug, no question. So when we look at substance abuse, one of the, the um, uh, concerns with Narcan is, is will it harm somebody who is not uh, 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 under the influence of an opiate? And the answer is no. Um, we can give it to people who are not under the influence of an opiate, it has no harm to them. Uh, if it does, if they do have opiates on board and they are in respiratory failure, this can save their life. So we look at people that are opiate users in the library and they have what's called being on the nod or opiate narcosis, which is they're asleep on their feet. Uh, the biggest thing I always see with substance abuse is really, really two issues. One is what we smell, which is the odor of alcohol or the odor of marijuana. Most people know what they smell like. The second is the pupils and pupils for people in under the influence of opiates, fentanyl, heroin, or, or opiate pills is, are pin dots, very, very thin, very, very small. And I'll show you a picture. People under the influence of stimulant drugs, typically methamphetamine, especially where I am out here in Missouri, we have plenty of it, uh, is blown out or dilated pupils. Most people, people's pupils in their normal light are three millimeters to six and a half. These people's are like 11s or 12s. They're just whopping big. People that are opiate users have these sites, uh, uh, signs and symptoms that you see on the screen. The biggest one that we're most concerned about is this opiate narcosis where they pass out and they're in jeopardy of dying. This young lady here is in a library in Northern California. She's under the influence of an opiate. You can see that her hands and feet are blue. She is cyanotic. She's in respiratory failure from opiate use and, and, and paramedics were called to save her life. Um, you can see the pin dot pupils here of opiate users. This is not um, 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 uncommon to see this population of very, very, very small pupils, even in normal room light. That is the typical, most uh, common um, uh, predictor of opiate use, fentanyl, that type of thing. You can also see that these are, this is a very unhygienic drug. You can see that things that, that come um, um, in, that you, you don't want to come in contact with any of these things related to fentanyl or powdered fentanyl or liquid um, um, heroin, which has been liquid, uh, made liquid by adding water and heating it so it melts, uh, anything that's related to needle sticks and whatnot. So in libraries, I have talked to library directors that say we take 40 heroin needles a, a month out of our library, which is stunning to me. Um, we see libraries where needles are left in the stacks and in the restrooms and all kinds of places where that's an exposure to patrons and also to staff. We have to have people in the libraries um, that know how to clean this stuff up that are trained in bloodborne pathogens. Um, you cannot be exposed to fentanyl. Um, you know, you can't, you, you can't, you could rub it on your skin as long as you don't have an open wound. It, it's like, you know, rubbing an aspirin on your skin if it's been ground up. But if you have an open wound or you inhale fentanyl, it could be fatal. So we see drug dogs die. We see cops get overwhelmed. We see people that are first responders. Paramedics get overwhelmed when they inhale fentanyl. It is, it is a deadly drug. So when we have people that are encounter anything that is anything related to drug paraphernalia, needles, uh, things that people leave laying around after they finish their drug use in the library, you must have gloves and mask, not just gloves, but mask. And the people that clean up this stuff have to have been trained in bloodborne pathogens. You can call the cops to have them come impound things. You can have your janitorial or maintenance or public works staff who have been trained in this come in and clean this stuff up if they have been trained in, in bloodborne pathogens and they use masks. So the things we're worried about with this is certainly needle sticks, MRSA, skin infections, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, exposure to powdered fentanyl can be fatal, and then needle sticks. God forbid somebody gets needle stuck in your library by uh, something that they came across in a book or the book drop. I've seen that too uh, in, the, in the restroom. Take what the that's poked this person, um, tape it to some cardboard or put it in some kind of glass jar and then take it to the hospital, have that tested as well. So the biggest issue I, I face in dealing with uh, drug users is stimulant drug users tend to be really erratic in their behavior. I just posted a, a piece on meth or the new meth uh, that's being used in the United States uh, on Library 2.0. You can check it out. Uh, just sign up and you'll, you'll get a copy of the, of the blog talks about this. I interview a drug expert about it. Uh, the biggest issue that we see with people on, on opiate drugs is, is, with, is the um, uh, possibility of overdose. So when I'm talking to this population who I suspect are drug and alcohol users, careful questions, careful instructions, um, ask them to leave for the day, assess if you have a medical concern or is a police concern if, based on their behavior. Sometimes when they are the most difficult and most, most confrontational is when they're in withdrawal from their opiate or when withdrawal from stimulant drugs, and they can be very problematic in their behavior. 
So let's talk about kids. And here we're back to that sort of rough age. My daughter went through it. You and I probably went through it. That 12 to 14, 12 to 15 years old, where you're, you're under the influence of peer pressure and puberty and hormones and immaturity, and you're hypersensitive to being slighted, especially in front of your peers. I'm big with this population in terms of alignment. Who's the best person to talk to this person? Is it a young, young adult librarian? Maybe it's an older librarian. Maybe it's a younger librarian. Maybe there's just a connection with certain, certain staff that do, do better with this population. I'm also big on the idea that we don't talk to all of them as a group about their behavior. We talk to one. Pull, pull who seems to be the smartest or the most um, um, in charge of the rest of the kids and go, hey, you can't do that if you want to stay here. You guys can't do this. You can't keep doing this if you want to stay here. And have that conversation separately and say, could you go back and tell your friends, don't do it in front of all of them because they just peck your eyes out like chickens. So when you look at at the need for the assertive whisper and physical movement, that's a perfect example of this population here. And then also look at the library impact. Is it a big deal that they're laughing and carrying on or not a big deal? And sometimes some patrons, especially older patrons can get bugged by the smallest sound. And you go, what's the impact on the library? If it's a low impact on the library, then, then you talk to the patron and say, maybe I can move you to a quieter place. If it's a big impact on the library, then we have to address it. <coughs> so think about at the bottom there, praise. Think about, uh, alignment, think about the two phrases I would suggest, right? You can't do that if you want to stay here or our insurance won't let you do that. Um, I oftentimes have a, a discussion where the library may be very close to a junior high or a, or a elementary school and we have problematic behavior in sort of that, that golden hour between 2 p.m. and 5. And we go back to the school and say, let's talk to the, to the counselors and the vice principal and, and, or the district and say, the school district and say, what can we do to help encourage better library behavior as a, as a, as a group of, of adult professionals, rather than just saying what the schools often say is, well, they left and they're your problem now. We, you know, they're not on our campus anymore. That's not the best approach. Figure out if we can come up again with kind of a task force group, group solution for this type of issue if it's a problem in your behavior. Okay, so here's something that comes up a lot. Um, I see it in more ways than I want to, especially involving children, which concerns me, people who take photos and videos. Now there's two types. One type comes in and has this sort of First Amendment um, constitutional type thinking, which is I'm going to intentionally come in and I ask you to make a comment on, into my cell phone or my microphone or into my camera. Uh, they come in with a tripod, the whole nine yards about COVID or Biden or Trump or or you know, Ukraine or whatever it happens to be because I want you to say something provocative so I can put it on my social media site. Okay, that's one group of people. The second group of people come in and it's typically males and they will take photographs of children or women. Uh, and this concerns me from a escalation standpoint in terms of what, what is their, what, you know, what, what period reasons are they doing these things for? I think with, with both groups, look at the bottom there, we're neutral, friendly, polite, and non-confrontational. And we don't allow our staff or colleagues, bosses don't allow people to come over and make political statements and say, well, here's what I think while you're on duty at the, at the library. You have the right to your opinion, but you wanna be neutral because this stuff can get taken out of context. You don't wanna end up on the evening news or the local news. Assess the business impact of this person coming in who wants to start this sort of political confrontation and know that for many um, libraries, and same as police stations and city hall and fire stations and public works lobbies, people have the right to be in a, in a public place. They have the right to be in a public, public facility. They don't have the right to be in a private part of a public facility, meaning they can come into the lobby of the library or the, or the open stacks area, but not go behind the scenes with their camera. So we have the right in a, in, as the shepherds of a public building to say, you cannot come into our area where we have proprietary or financial or employee data, and this is employees only area, but you can, you can stand here and, and pontificate about whatever in, in the library. Usually what they're looking for is some type of confrontation with staff. And you go, I'm gonna go do my job now, or I have to leave and go help other people. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you and, and let them do their thing. And they get bored once they realize that there's no confrontation. Now, the second group, which is the covert or overt taking of photos or videos of library patrons or kids is especially concerning to me because oftentimes it is an escalating behavior, meaning they do things to, you know, of a sexual nature that, that arouses them and then it escalates to more physical things later on. We wanna stop this behavior in a couple of ways. One, that I am a big fan of posted code of conduct language that says no photographs or videos without consent of library leadership. So you say you can't take pictures or, or uh, videos in here of anybody, including staff or other patrons or children without permission from the library. So 
if there's, you know, we're shooting a commercial and we've given the building, you know, to them to do the commercial for something for the library, that's fine. Certainly it has permission, but that, that is a good code of conduct rule to put in to say, and, and get some help about the language from your colleagues in other libraries or from city attorney or county council about saying, how do we put in language that does not allow photography or video of patrons or staff, especially kids in the library? So this is another challenging one. Um, patrons come in who are oftentimes either in one person or as a group and they come in and they want to see you remove or the library remove material that's either circulated or curated that you have gathered in the collections or things that they think is you know, um, uh, against whatever political values or beliefs or causes they have. Again, one of the first issues for this population is to get you to say something provocative on camera. Don't do that, right? And look at the bottom there. First Amendment has limits. Hate speech, dangerous or inciting speech is not allowed under the First Amendment. You can't say, let's burn down the building, let's blow up this place. First Amendment has its limits. If we get to the place where a person won't leave after making those kinds of, of, of dangerous comments, we call the cops, all right? They can be escorted off the property. But come up with, and look at the bottom there, a scripted response for people who are arguing about content, whether it relates to you know, transgender issues or, or you know, the any kind of concern that they have about something that they don't believe is correct for their community, go back to the city attorneys, county council, library leaders, library boards, elected officials, and say, what is our approach here? What do you want us to say? What is our mission statement as a library for all the community if against this group here who is protesting these particular things here? What is our best approach that we don't wing it? We don't come up with a off the cuff sort of response, like, you know, get over it too bad or you know, we, we have the right to put out what we want, but we come up with a concept that says, this is what we're going to say to the news media. This is what we're going to say to, to an individual person. This is what we're going to say to a group of people who happen to be, you know, protesting various things. Elderly or disabled patron. My big concern here is that they are being exploited by caregivers. And my wife uh, was an elder abuse detective in the PD for San Diego for 10 years. And, and then she was in sex crimes for five um, in her 30 year career, you know, a good chunk of her time was spent on elder abuse and not surprisingly, she's an investigator here in the state of Missouri for elder abuse issues here. So what I have seen in her work and in my own experience in libraries is that caregivers will bring uh, elderly or disabled patrons. This could be a someone who has a physical disability where they cannot care for themselves, not just in a wheelchair or missing a limb or blind or deaf, but they cannot care for themselves and need a caregiver. And this caregiver, and I use that term in quotes because they're not a very good one, will leave the person at the table at the library and then disappear for six hours. In San Diego, they used to go to the Indian casino and that was quite a concern, right? They'd come back and this person has been sitting without a bathroom break or access to water or food or anything for hours and hours. That is abuse, okay? We have in our counties a child protective services number or in a child protective services, social worker response, and an adult protective services, which is 65 or over, or developmentally disabled or physically disabled adults who cannot care for themselves who are 18 to 64. Anything over 65 is considered to be an elder, and then we have adult protective services for both of those groups. So you may need to contact or may want to contact adult protective services when you suspect abuse of people that are under the care of a, quote, caregiver in the library. The other thing we see, uh, look at the first paragraph there, sundowner syndrome, which is sometimes the person coming in who has cognitive issues, Alzheimer's or early dementia, may be more um, functioning and, and communicative in the morning. And as the day goes on, they get tired and they get more confused and they're much more um, um, difficult to deal with what's this is called sundowner syndrome. So uh, oftentimes uh, we may come across patients who are lonely or in physical pain because of their age and their mobility and, and physical restrictions and things like that. So our empathy is, is really you know, quite high and our patience is quite high, but we want to pay attention. And this is the critical part for me to the possibility of abuse. Okay, patron hogs or misuses the internet. We have a couple of possibilities here. One is what is your policy for your particular library about filtering? What is your policy for your particular library about inappropriate pornographic content? I don't mean child pornography, which is illegal, but do you allow pornography to be viewed in your library? Some libraries do. Uh, other librarians have really, libraries have very strict um, um, content policies and also displaying those to other people as a way to get kicked out of the library or to lose your internet privileges. Other libraries, it's it's the sky's the limit. What is your policy? And, and we have kind of four different possibilities. One is we have filtering and staff is quite vigilant. Other is we have filtering staff does not is not vigilant about the issue. 
Third one, we have no vigilance and no filtering. And the fourth one is staff is vigilant, even if we don't have filtering. That's the one I typically see, which is we don't filter, but we're vigilant about not allowing people, usually men again, to display pornography or other objectionable things in front of the rest of the patrons walking around. You know, I could write a whole uh, blog about this. Maybe I will one day about, I don't understand why men look at pornography in the library. I understand why men look at pornography. I don't understand why they do it in a public place other than to be provocative or, or compulsive or eccentric or immature. Uh, they seem to like bothering or, or surprising or irritating other people. Um, it's a, it's a, a perfect road for confrontation between staff and, and these people and staff and patrons who are furious about it. Sometimes it's, it's moms, sometimes it's dads, it's a bad situation. I really am believe in a strong internet policy about content, strong internet policy about use and, and kicking people off the system or banning them from the library if they continue because a good predictor of future behavior is past behavior. We call the police if we have the presence of child pornography, actual or suspected, and we see illegal sexual behaviors like exposing themselves or things like that, which happens sometimes when these people you know, don't get any more excitement out of what they're seeing on the screen, they ramp up their behavior. Uh, think about another possibility. This is an outside the box solution. Uh, there are groups around the United States that are connected to law enforcement. They're called ICAC, I-C-A-C. Some of you may have heard of NECMEC, which is the uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I've seen John Walsh's work on TV. Um, but uh, uh, ICAC, I-C-A-C, Internet Crimes Against Children, I think there are 61 or 62 uh, ICAC uh, agencies around the United States. Uh, most uh, large uh, cities have them. Uh, San Diego had one, for example. There are, there are several in California, and each state has at least one. And the ICAC is Internet Crimes Against Children, which is um, FBI agents, U.S. Marshals, um, Customs, Border Patrol, um, um, local PD, local sheriffs, prosecutors, social workers working together for child pornography online. And this is uh, children who have been exploited from other countries or this country and the stuff is being um, shown here. If you have concerns about that, you may contact ICAC and say, what, what can we do if we have this type of situation involving what we think is child pornography, if you wanna get you know, more help than what maybe the local police can do. Okay, let me tell you about thought stopping as we wrap up here. I'm gonna give you a couple other, other uh, tools for your toolkit. Thought stopping is a last ditch, Hail Mary. This is the thing I'm going to try when this patron has what is called perseveration. Perseveration is broken record. And furthermore, and as I said before, the, they tell you the same story six times. Thought stopping is when you go, you know, is it starting to rain outside? And the person looks around and goes, no, it's not starting to rain. And they come back and they're, huh? What was I talking about again? They're back to normal. You have bumped their brain with, with a little, they bump the VCR, which is their head. Bump the DVD player, right? Is that your yellow motorcycle parked out there? And they look around, they go, I don't have a yellow motorcycle. What was I, what was I, I saying again, right? And they, they come back down to reality. They go from 100 miles an hour down to zero. Now, you can't do it in the first two seconds of the conversation because it's odd or it makes them furious. But after you've heard the story for the 15th time, try thought stopping. The other thing is I've said, try those phrases which are kind of built into the introduce, uh, explain and ask, which is also a thought stopping. Wow, I haven't heard those kind of curse words since I was in junior high. I bet you know what I'm gonna ask you to stop doing, right? Those are thought stopping things because now the person has to go, yeah, okay, you got me, or okay, I see what you're gonna say. And then the last one's kind of interesting. This is really weird, but try it. There's a concept called the double huh or the double what. Sometimes you ask the person a question, they go, huh, or what? And what you simply say back to them is, huh, or what? Uh, Sir, uh, do you have a library card? And they go, huh? And you go, huh? And they go, no, I don't have a library card. It's amazing how people will answer the question if you just say, huh, or what, whatever they said. Sir, do you have a library card? What? And you go, what? And they go, no, I don't have a library card. Try it and see if it works. Because you can get on their wavelength just by saying either, huh, if that's what they said, or what. And it's amazing how that works. Give it a try. Thought stopping. Um, if you want the best example of thought stopping I ever saw, it was in the movie Saving Private Ryan. If you remember the film with Tom Hanks, um, these guys are getting ready to shoot each other because it was almost a mutiny. And Tom Hanks says to one of the corporals, what's the, uh, what's the pool up, up on me as to what my job is? And he goes, sir, aren't you going to do anything about this? And he goes, how much is in the pool? Like 80, 90 bucks? I'm a school teacher. And he turns and tells a story about being a school teacher and a baseball coach in Indiana. And everybody stops and looks at him. That is a thought stopping moment in that scene. Okay, a couple of personal protection things and we'll get you out of here. One, Personal space we talked about. Now, a bladed stance, let me, let me go on the video and tell you what I'm talking about, okay? So a bladed stance is not this. This is toe-to-toe, face-to-face, nose-to-nose, we got into it. A bladed stance is this, or what we call an offset stance. 
Here, this is what the Indians call colliding shadows or crossing shadows. My shadow is right on top of this person. Here, my shadow is going this way. Theirs is going this way. We're not in this sort of position or of collision of shadows, right? So this bladed stance goes a long way towards lowering the emotional temperature simply by how you stand and move your feet. A pretty cool picture behind me here in the back. This is uh, Ernest Hemingway's uh, office in, in um, Key West, Florida. Careful eye contact. Polite handshakes as necessary if you think that's appropriate. Staying in condition yellow, which says when I'm around strangers, I pay attention. Condition white is eat your sandwich, relax, get a cup of coffee in the back, go potty, relax, be ready to go back out there. Condition red is protect yourself or get out of there. Condition yellow says I'm around strangers, around patrons, around people I don't know, I pay attention. My, I'm, I'm not looking at my phone or looking at papers or walking around, I'm not looking at things, I pay attention. We talked about changing the ratios of confrontation. We talked about the value of uh, gestures. And let me go back on the video to give you two gestures. One, one gesture would be here, right? So I pointed the person and I point down, which means come, come help me. Come walk over here and stand by me. The other one is I point at the person, a colleague or a boss and go like this, which means watch me from a little distance. Sometimes I may need you to come here and help me because I want you to contribute to the conversation. Another one I may point and say, watch from a distance, which says just come over and sort of be around and watch my back as I do what I do. Okay. The other code word we do is typically when we want to call the police. You can say Dr. Leo, L-E-O stands for law enforcement officer. When I was in California, we used to say call Arnold as in Schwarzenegger, right? Come up with a code word. Um, I oftentimes use the color of the uniforms for that particular community. If it's sheriffs and they wear green or, or brown or black or tan or whatever it is, you know, call Dr. Khaki sounds stupid, but come up something that has a code word connected to go safe place and call law enforcement. The reason we have code words for that is we don't want the situation to escalate where we say to the person, one more word out of you, pal, I'm calling the cops. And then they escalate their behavior because they know the cops are coming. We talked about proximate barriers, space and distance. And, and how sometimes too close is too close. And we may need to use desks or chairs or counters. Uh, you can physically come out from behind the counter if you feel comfortable doing it or not if you don't. You can back away from the counter. You don't have to stand with your hips glued to the counter. Uh, you, can, you don't have to defend this piece of carpet or concrete with your life. Um, invite the person to sit down, shake hands if you think that might be an appropriate way to break kind of a, of a tension this person has with you. Physical movement, let's step over here. Let's talk over here, sir. And the assertive whisper is a way for you to gain control over situations and help the patron save face. Last thing, secret service hands, okay? Let me try this with you here. I talk to people who make me feel uncomfortable with my hands in this position. I understand what you're saying, sir. Could you call Dr. Green, please? Right, no, I hear what you're saying, right? For me, from Secret Service hands here, it says from this position, I can push away or I can protect myself, but it sort of looks sort of low key. And you say, do they really, they really call it that, Steve? Yes, they do, okay? Look at this guy here on the top left here uh, in the gray suit, that's Secret Service hands. See how he's holding his hands? Now let's look at another cat here. This guy just got retired from the Secret Service and he was protecting all kinds of people. There he is bottom left with Trump, Secret Service hands. Uh, here he is in the center. Uh, um, I forget who he's with here, maybe Trump, uh, Secret Service hands. Look him on the bottom right with Obama, Secret Service hands. Look at him over here with Obama, Secret Service hands, right? I couldn't oppose this guy any better. Think about these guys. I couldn't oppose them any better either. That is Secret Service hands. So when I'm talking to people who I feel uncomfortable in terms of my safety, I have my hands in this kind of prayer position. I can protect myself. I can do something as necessary, but it looks sort of low key. And if I don't have to do anything, even better. Now, here's the other cool part about Secret Service hands. It's a code word. What does it say to your colleagues? Come over and help me. I'm concerned. You see somebody standing like this. It says, I'm a little concerned about this person. Come over and let's change the ratios of confrontation. Bring over somebody else. I don't want to have to protect myself. I want you to come over while I do. So I couldn't oppose these guys any better, huh? Okay, last things get you out of here. We cannot pick our patrons. We can't pick our customers, but we can enforce our code of conduct and our policies and create a safety and service and security culture together. Every employee no matter how long you've been there or what your job is, your job title. And guess what? Patron doesn't care what your job title is. They only care about getting served, right? Every employee is in charge of service, safety, and security in the library, okay? Certain employees align better, right, than your, than your colleagues. Maybe your boss is a better alignment. Maybe you're a better alignment based on age or race or gender or, or language skills or whatever you have where you talk better to the, to the patron, then you handle it. If your colleague is a better fit, then let them handle it or your boss. Acting skills. Acting assertive, acting not afraid, acting in a, in a, in a firm, fair, reasonable manner, being um, assertive but neutral and polite in those situations where people come in and want to film and videotape we talked about. Um, think about the training that we need for employees, high-risk customer service skills. Think about Thompson's book, Verbal Judo. Um, somebody um, um, 
uh, think about the Crucial Conversations book. Take a look at some of the Crucial Conversations videos. Think about how we, we have a policy of how we treat people over the telephone. We set boundaries over the phone. We don't allow cursing. We hang up on people who curse at us and we document that conversation. So if they come back later to complain, we protect ourselves as a professional service provider. But we set boundaries for people over the phone. Role plays, especially during staff meetings. What do we do, group, about this guy? What do we do, group, about this lady that comes in? What do we do about this group of kids? What do we do about this person who comes in with that's the starer or the person who's elderly and has some cognitive issues? What do we do about this, this little kid that runs through the library and is not supervised by a parent? Uh, what do we do about theft? What do we do about this particular gentleman who's experiencing uh, sobriety or homelessness or mental health issues? Let's come up with a standard, not robotic, but standard response as to what we do. Think about the business impact. If it's not hurting the library, move on to something else. If it does hurt the business, the library, you got to address it. Why? Because people post on social media and other places that the library is not a safe place because they don't feel that the staff pays attention. That is a big business impact issue. Update, discuss, refine, edit, improve constantly on a regular basis, not just every 10 years, but on a regular basis, your code of conduct. And in my perfect library world, it would be posted where other folks could see it. Think of that cool thing that they put on the wheels. They could roll it around from room to room. Firm, fair, consistent, assertive, reasonable, legal, uh, empathic, patient. That is the big eight that we talked about. Stop, stop calling patrons difficult and change your vocabulary and your, your approach to them as to being more challenging. And then think about those relationships. It's with social services. It's with adult protective services, child protective services, um, Goodwill, um, St. Vincent de Paul, Salvation Army, mental health, um, of substance abuse providers, public and private and grant funded agencies that may be able to come in and give you information, advice, support, training about the folks that you may have to deal with that are more challenging. Last one, come up with those creative answers to those situations in the staff discussion where you say, this is what we typically do, whether it's about protected content, whether it's about things that we're displays or meetings that we're having or trainings or things that are going on, uh, um, uh, programs that we're running that people are going to complain about. What is our response? Get that vetted and, and make sure that's what we all say so we're not going off, uh, off of our, our message. Security incident reports, big for me. It tells me what's going on. It tells me what need to, we need to fix. It also helps you, as especially as a library leader, have some um, leverage over things where you say we need more security or security guards or more staff or improvements in our facility. And we don't just do it based on anecdotal, but we do it based on historical documents. Um, think about the value of kicking people out of the library in a polite way. Um, I like to see a code of conduct that has, has steps First time we do this, second time we do this, third time we do this, you know, week, month, year, where we get people in situations where there are consequences for their behavior, including even in those dangerous situations involving domestic violence or violent threats, civil stay away orders or restraining orders. Again, uh, as DeBecker said, observe and monitor is one perspective. You can always get tougher. You can always step on the gas pedal, hard to get the toothpaste back in the tube. Lastly, Thanks for everything you've done during the pandemic, all the things that you've had to deal with in terms of, of the masks and discussions about the rules and the, and the healthcare things and all the stuff related to the services we are trying to provide during the pandemic. You have been courageous during that and I applaud what you have done. So thanks everybody. And back over to, to Annie and any questions, I'm happy to uh, share or my answers with you. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um... Folks, if you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat and um, I will read them out for you. Um, any any was, questions on your side, anything? That was so much information. I'm still like digesting. I give a ton of stuff. So take uh, everybody, um, get access to the slides, print the ones that you need, the ones that are best for you and, and that'll help a lot. And you said consultant. So if a library was so interested, could they reach out to you for um, more training sort of in their own libraries and library districts? Sure, I do that all the time and I'm, I'm happy to um, um, talk with them and they can email me, they can get hold of me through library 2.0 as well. And we've got a lot of stuff related to um, service, safety, security, leadership, um, staff, things that are blogs and, and podcasts and stuff that I've done that are very useful for lots of subjects. So I'm happy to talk about anything that they have specific. Um, we have the Ask Dr. Steve, which is people can ask me certain scenarios that, that happen. Looks like we have a chat, maybe anything came up here. Uh, Someone asked uh, for staff development. 
as a training, which I think would be a great idea. Yeah, my it's funny. My most um, um, important day for staff development for me as a trainer is always Columbus Day. I, I do more trainings in, in October on Columbus Day. They always seem to close the library on that day. They always do staff. That's the first day in whenever the new year starts, the first day somebody always books. So that's interesting. Thanks, everybody, for your, your comments and your attention. And, and uh, Annie, from um, your side, I'm happy to uh, support anything you're doing in, in Idaho for the um, ongoing discussions that we need to have. Just get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll do. Well, I am going to end the recording.